these are the forces uh, that are, are lined up at this time against the coalition forces. What they're not doing, it seems, is trying to come onto the highway where the coalition dominates the situation. At the same time, as the coalition has described, they're not going to try and get into urban conflict, not going to try and put civilian lives at risk. And this uh, is where these uh, mili Iraqi militia forces are holding back, staying inside those urban environments. Despite that, however, Iraq's information minister continues to say that Iraq's forces will defeat uh, the coalition at this time. It's the same desperate attempts to weaken our resistance, but our forces, especially the commandos, are preparing to destroy them. We burned some of the vehicles in El Rashid camp, and now they are isolated in the city. Also isolated at this time, a small team of journalists on the banks of the Tigris. Their uh, building uh, came under very close attack earlier in the day. They've been unable to leave that neighborhood. They've been putting in phone calls to, to the International Committee for the Red Cross to get them evacuated from their building. They seem very much at this time caught up, uh, very, very close to the fighting. Also, civilians in Baghdad unable to escape the fighting. The hospitals in Baghdad seeing increasing numbers of casualties coming in. We don't have an accurate uh, account of how many people have been injured, how many killed. Neither do we know accurately how many of the people injured are military fighters and how many of them are civilians. Certainly that is uh, Iraq, Iraqi officials have until now at least tried to keep hidden from journalists the military casualties, showing them only civilian casualties. But the hospitals in Baghdad reporting uh, still taking in high numbers of casualties during the conflict at this particular stage. I'm Nick Robertson, CNN in Ruayshid. More, more U.S. troops are pouring into Baghdad every day, and as they arrive, they're greeted by Iraqi weapons fire. CNN's Martin Savage is now in the southeastern edge of Baghdad with the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. The Marine unit that we're embedded with came into the actual city of Baghdad early this morning, actually before the sun came up, crossing over a canal and then entering into Baghdad proper. As they came in, they came through a grove, a huge grove, almost a forest of palm trees, and there they came under attack and under fire. As they uh, suppressed that and began to investigate, they found a huge stash of artillery pieces, anti-aircraft guns, uh, and other various forms of ammunition and hardware. And so the Marines quickly went about the job of destroying it. This is sort of demolition that is done on the fly here. The Marines are obviously still trying to push forward through their objectives. So this is not something carefully planned and drawn out as you might do with a specific demolition team. Instead, uh, it is Marines going through the underbrush there, quickly locating the Iraqi artillery, and then using either hand grenades or incendiary grenades, uh, lobbing them into place there and then running out of the way before they detonate. And there's not only the danger of the initial explosion, but of course all the ammunition that supports that uh, artillery that is there. And as a result of that, there are secondary explosions that come and go quite frequently. So this was uh, occupying about a good part of a half hour to an hour for those forces as they went through that palm grove and methodically, piece after piece, wanted to make sure it wouldn't be used again, wanted to make sure specifically if anybody came in behind them, they wouldn't be using it to attack them from the rear. And that was their operation there. Then they moved into an industrial complex. They did run into fighting there. At times, the fighting was intense. Uh, tank fire, mortar fire coming at them. Also heavy machine gun fire outgoing. The Marines were heavily outgunning whoever was attacking them. And uh, they came across a stash of what appears to have been a Republican Army Guard uh, headquarters or at least a position that might have been in place there to defend. They didn't find anybody there. They did find a lot of equipment that appears to have been abandoned in a hurry, including chemical suits, gas masks, rubber boots, gloves, canisters, and medicines, including, we are told, atropine. That was CNN's Martin Savage with the 7th Marines in southeastern Baghdad on the scene for us. The Pentagon is defending its rules of engagement after three journalists are killed in Baghdad. Up next, why U.S. forces say they fired on a hotel filled with reporters. Also ahead, a family shattered by war. One young boy struggled to survive amid tragedy.
best to help secure your future. You start with your dreams. Difference in the joints. Guaranteed. One. Construction at the site had raised suspicions about a renewed Iraqi nuclear program, but UN weapons inspectors visited the site numerous times and found nothing. Hospitals all over Iraq and especially in Baghdad are running low on supplies and struggling to keep up with the number of casualties pouring through their doors. The Red Cross says the hospitals don't have enough supplies to deal with patients suffering everything from burns to shrapnel wounds. A World Health Organization convoy full of medical equipment is in Jordan but has been unable to cross into Iraq because of security concerns. A reminder, we bring you the latest headlines every 15 minutes here on MSNBC or for your New York computer. Drop by any time at iraq.msnbc.com for the very latest. I'll be back with more headlines in 15 minutes. Right now, let's go to Pat Buchanan and Bill Press in Washington. Fellas. Okay, thank you, Lester. Thanks, Lester. And Bill Press and I are both here on Buchanan and Press this afternoon, folks. Three journalists dead in Baghdad. Two were killed at the Palestine Hotel. One a Reuters correspondent, another for Spanish TV. But also an Al Jazeera correspondent has been killed at the Al Jazeera headquarters in Baghdad. And our guest is Hafaz al Marazi, who heads up the Washington Bureau of Al Jazeera. Uh, Hafez al Marazi, before we go to that, uh, the journalist who was killed, and, and uh, the United States has expressed regret over that, can you, ask, can you answer sort of point blank whether you have any intelligence whether or not that airstrike, which was clearly targeting Saddam Hussein and reportedly one or two of his sons last night, was that successful? Is Saddam dead? Uh, I have no idea, uh, Pat. Uh, the only thing that we reported uh, on yesterday was the uh, the effect and the footage of the uh, civilian uh, uh, casualties in that site because this is a very uh, a civilian place, Al Mansur neighborhood, and uh, at least we interviewed some people who who lost uh, some members of their families, including someone who lost his grandson in that place in that attack. All right, Hafez al Marazi. Uh, I mean, we've lost here at NBC David Bloom, one of our own correspondents, and I'm sure you must feel as badly about the, the man that you lost in Baghdad. But my understanding is Al Jazeera is reporting that this was deliberate. A, is that true? And B, do you have any information that this was not simply an accident in the fog of war? Well, we, uh, we, we, we would like to believe that uh, it was an accident, but it's really very difficult to win. Uh, this is not the first time. Uh, it comes in a series of attacks against Al Jazeera with using uh, so-called smart weapons and smart missiles. The first one happened against our uh, office in Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, in November just uh, less than uh, one month after the beginning of the war and few hours before the fall of uh, the Afghani capital, capital when most of the people in Washington and everywhere were so worried about Al Jazeera taking pictures of civilian casualty of, or retribution and revenge when the Northern Alliance would get into the capital. So uh, uh, ironically, just a few hours before um, even a few lights that might have been there a night or two ago have been switched off. Um, talking about snipers, we don't know where they might be, if there are any, and maybe uh, by mistake we get targeted again. I guess uh, not too many cameras will be on the balconies tonight. Is it, Chris, in, in a word, is it your belief that, or the belief of any there, that coalition forces are intentionally targeting journalists? No, not really, although uh, one might maybe consider the, the, the hit this afternoon an almost intentional hit because uh, there were two cameras on that balcony and uh, they're big enough to, to be recognized as such. Understood. Christian Pelt, who's at the Palestine Hotel and has been filing reports for us. Chris, we greatly appreciate your reports and the fact that you're the eyes and ears on the ground there for us. Uh, our condolences to the family of the other journalists and all the rest who've lost their lives, of course, in this conflict. And uh, a reminder to our viewers that, of course, Christian Pelt uh, is one who is minded by Iraqis. Uh, they, they monitor what he says and how he says it. Uh, his safety is important to us, as I'm sure it is to the viewing audience. Coming up next from Studio B, Saddam dead or alive.
his safety, well, is not as important, according to coalition forces, because his regime is dead, according to the coalition, whether he lives or dies. But is that the straight truth? If Saddam Hussein is gone, is this thing much easier to wrap up? And if he is not, after this big strike, is it even more trouble with Fedayeen, Saddam, and the rest? That's part of our continuing coverage coming next. Twenty-one minutes past the hour from Studio B, and earlier Fox News talked by phone with the Air Force pilot who is said to have unloaded the bombs last night aimed for this Iraqi senior leadership. That is what Captain Chris Wachter had to say after he learned that he might have been taking out the dictator himself. The high priority target, uh, and that's fine. We're happy to do that. Um, and uh, when we came back and people told us that we might might have done that, um, we were happy. Um, hopefully, it, you know, we're uh, protecting the world by uh, ridding them of uh, bad people. So how did they target that dictator? More on that now from Studio B to the chief political correspondent, Carl Cameron, in our Washington newsroom. Uh, Carl, uh, uh, a frequent contributor to our own internal wire services and information that we learn and what we can and can't report. And this is a, a voluminous copy, if bound, Carl. Uh, it's very interesting to see how we got to the bottom of the details of of how they flushed this guy out. I guess it started with a sat phone conversation? Well, one of the things that has been a sort of a byproduct of uh, the American forces being in Baghdad now is it's made it much, much easier for us to monitor what's happening with the Iraqi leadership. For months, we've been able to monitor and surveil their electronic communication, sort of the wireless things on cell phones and satellites, etc. But there was a period wherein the Iraqi forces were able to keep a lot of their communications land-based, particularly using fiber optic cable, which you've got to dig up out of the ground in order to listen in on. Uh, but since we've been on the ground and destroyed so much of Iraqi communications, they've been forced to use their satellite phones and and we know uh, even what brands the Iraqi government prefers uh, one is the Thoraya which is out of uh, the United Arab Emirates and so there were intercepted phone calls yesterday uh, some sources believe that it's possible no way to be certain but it's possible that Saddam's voice was actually heard in one instance and that Saddam, Saddam's son Kuse was heard in another and the combination of that uh, eavesdrop surveillance information and some human intelligence from sources on the ground indicated that there was going to be this leadership meeting in this sort of elite residential area outside Baghdad. And there was a very, very short amount of turnaround time, and they were obviously able to, to drop the J-dams and destroy the location. Uh, but there are some unanswered questions. The reality is that particular neighborhood does have catacombs of tunnels. The restaurant that well, the meeting was uh, either in or next to does either back up or sit on top of a bunker. And at this point, uh, the U.S. government is not certain that that bunker is attached to a tunnel or not. If it were attached to a tunnel, it's possible that Saddam Hussein may have escaped. Uh, with others. There's a growing speculation that it in fact was tunnels that helped Saddam Hussein survive the decapitation strike that began this war now nearly three weeks ago. Uh, so that remains to be seen. If in fact they can get into the rubble and find human remains and conduct DNA testing, uh, it would still be a couple of days before there'd be a positive confirmation. But as a practical matter here, Shep, it really doesn't matter because as one analyst told me earlier, if he's alive and tries to talk to his leadership again, we'll know. And if he's alive and hiding and on the run, we'll find him. And if he's dead, well, sooner or later, it all ends to the same inevitability, and that is the regime change in the end of Saddam Hussein. But, Carl, isn't there a belief that if he's dead, we can prove he's dead to the satisfaction of those who work for him, for lack of a better phrase? Couldn't this be wrapped up with fewer casualties, possibly, than in other circumstances? Well, and, and there's a variety of scenarios that are being sort of discussed outside formal government circles, and that is that there is a distinct possibility that this attack, whether or not Saddam Hussein Hussein was there or not will rattle Iraqi military and perhaps cause them to stand down to some extent. There's another uh, sort of counterintuitive look at this which suggests that the whole thing could have been a ruse by the Iraqis to find out whether or not the coalition was monitoring their particular communications and that, and that as a counterintelligence matter, Saddam Hussein is a very clever, incredibly neurotic, paranoid, uh, diabolical individual who is not at all above having a neighborhood in his own capital city taken out just to find out if we're listening to him. Uh, so all of these things are very much being assessed today. If he was in that building, there is a great deal of optimism that he's dead. 
but we, someone was seen going in with both human as well as signal intelligence. We're talking about people on the ground as well as electronic surveillance. Someone who looked like Saddam Hussein was seen going into that building. Nobody looking like him came out, uh, and that raises the question, is he dead or did he escape via a tunnel? Or was this whole thing some way to sort of smoke out our ability to track who they're talking about? The other thing I should tell you, Shep, is that some of the communications from Saddam Hussein's son, Kuse, have, have also been captured by coalition intelligence operatives. And it indicates that a lot of the senior military in the field, the commanders, are essentially deceiving uh, the Iraqi leadership itself by giving them more than rosy reports. There you see the bio on, on Saddam's son, Kuse. He was put in charge of the security of Baghdad just before the war began by his dad. And uh, some of the intercepted information suggests that the field commanders are essentially lying to Kuse and Saddam because they're afraid to say things aren't going well because this is a regime that's been known to shoot the messenger, and they're afraid, frankly, to say they're not doing well in the field. Been known to shoot the messengers. Happened in the last war, execution style, right after the war. But, Carl, you mentioned this, uh, people on the ground. I find that fascinating, because that's a neighborhood where people like, I don't know anybody who can go to that neighborhood who has ever been able to go to that neighborhood, and the idea that the CIA would have been able to infiltrate that neighborhood speaks volumes about the work they've been able to do. Well, there's something like 30 intelligence agencies involved right now with the war on Iraq, on the ground, in the air, uh, and in neighboring communities, working the phones, etc. And they've been there for a long, long time. The initial intelligence special operations groups in Baghdad goes back several months before the war began. And it's a variety of things, not only uh, Arabic-speaking Iraqis working for the U.S. government, but also people who are effectively defecting and staying in Baghdad and now working with the coalition to topple Saddam Hussein. Those numbers will grow and grow and grow as our military presence uh, continues to burgeon there. And there, have been, there has been a lot of information given to us by people on the ground. It's, it's suspect. Can't be sure whether or not we're getting legitimate tips or not in a lot of these cases, but our guys are there and there is a growing number of Iraqis who are helping. Carl Cameron, Live Force in Washington. Carl, great to see you again. I mean, think about it. If in fact, if in fact, Carl, thank you. See you later. Thank you, Greg. Uh, if in fact, if in fact they think he's dead, how many more of them will be helping the coalition? Something to think about in the days to come as this story evolves. Coming up live from Studio B, you're looking live in uh, Command Center in Qatar, the, uh, the uh, staging ground there for military questions that sometimes get answered. Many questions today about the massive strike in the, in the Mansour section of Baghdad. Was Saddam Hussein really inside there or did he get out through those tunnels and can we know? Plus, you're looking live at the White House, where President Bush will return later today after a summit with Tony Blair. The commander-in-chief saying whether he's alive or dead, Saddam is losing his grip on Iraq. Finger by finger, is that propaganda or truth? We'll analyze it coming up. Hello, everyone. I'm Paige Hopkins, and here are your latest headlines in Operation Iraqi Freedom. In Baghdad, the U.S. military has taken control of the Rashid Military Airport. That's in the southeastern part of the city. The 3rd Marine Division crossed over the Diyala using a bridge that was destroyed by the Iraqis but was repaired overnight. In the western part of the city, the 3rd Infantry Division foiled an Iraqi counterattack. Members of the Special Republican Guard were part of the force that tried to retake a bridge over the Tigris River. At least 50 Iraqi soldiers were killed. Two coalition soldiers and some civilians were wounded. Central Command says it may send U.S. forces to the site of a Baghdad airstrike aimed at taking out Saddam Hussein and his two sons. It's not clear if Hussein was actually there at the time of the attack. The strike was launched after intelligence information tipped the coalition off. The Iraqi dictator was attending a military meeting. In the southern city of Basra, British forces have their hands full, but not with fighting off Saddam Hussein's soldiers. They have to try and distribute the tons of humanitarian aid that's now flowing into that city while trying to restore law and order. The main problem? Looters. Thieves are said to be roaming the city armed with AK-47 rifles, stealing from almost every building in sight. And those are the latest headlines from Operation Iraqi Freedom. I'm Paige Hopkins.
just as coalition forces make another major show of force inside Baghdad, President Bush with his strongest ally, the British Prime Minister Tony Blair, promising it's just a matter of time before Saddam's regime is history. Team Fox coverage on this now. Mike Tobin live at CENTCOM headquarters in Qatar. But first, Molly Hanneberg live at the White House. Molly? Hi, Shep. The president says it's possible that Saddam Hussein could have been killed when those bombs fell on that building yesterday, but he says we just don't know. The president was in Northern Ireland for about 20 hours meeting with British Prime Minister Tony Blair, and they discussed issues relating to post-Saddam Iraq and also issues about the fate of Saddam Hussein. Whether or not Pres uh, Saddam Hussein is dead, President Bush says we do know that the grip of terror that Saddam Hussein has around the throats of the Iraqi people is loosening. I can't tell you if all ten fingers are off the throat, but finger by finger is coming off. And, uh, and the people are beginning to realize that. It's important for the Iraqi people to continue to hear this message. We will not stop until they are free. Saddam Hussein will be gone. President Bush and Prime Minister Blair met in Hillsborough Castle outside of Belfast, Northern Ireland. They say they'll agree to help get an interim authority run by the Iraqis in and outside of the country operating as soon as possible. And that interim authority would help keep the country functioning while a more permanent government takes shape and then the Iraqis can elect their own leadership. As for the role of the United Nations in this process, both men repeated that the United Nations would have, quote, a vital role. We heard that phrase a lot, a vital role, but it would not have the lead role. President Bush and Prime Minister Blair seem to agree that the United Nations will not be in control in post-Saddam Iraq. President Bush says a vital role means the U.N. will help with delivering food, medicine, even perhaps suggesting people who should be a part of that interim authority. Prime Minister Blair said all this discussion should not be mired in an endless diplomatic wrangling over who does what in post-war Iraq. And this new Iraq that will emerge is not to be run either by us or indeed by the UN. That is a false choice. It will be run by the Iraqi people. All of us will do what we can to help in that process of transition. Both President Bush and Prime Minister Blair both talked today about what's happening in Basra, Iraq. As British forces move in and sort of clean out Saddam Hussein's loyalists, the people there are freer to express their opinions and some leadership is emerging. And a U.S. official says that's happening all over the country as the people are freed. And Prime Minister Blair and President Bush seem to suggest that's what the international community should be focusing on and encouraging at this time. Substituting for White House Angle, I'm White House Henneberg. <laughs> Shep, back to you. Molly, thanks very much. Back to our top story now, a coalition strike on a target where Saddam Hussein was believed to be meeting with other Iraqi leaders from Studio B to Mike Tobin to find out what they're saying about this at Central Command, if anything. Mike? Well, Shepard, uh, as much as the generals here at Central Command would like to focus on the military objectives, getting rid of weapons of mass destruction, uh, liberating the Iraqi people, getting aid into the Iraqi people, they absolutely cannot escape this question now. Is Saddam Hussein dead? You know the story now. 2,000-pound bombs, JDAMs, were dropped on this uh, Al-Mansur uh, Al uh, neighborhood after intelligence was gained that Saddam Hussein and his sons were there. Uh, it left a crater in the ground. The Pentagon says there are some signs that someone is directing the Republican Guard forces, but the generals here at CENTCOM are looking for some kind of signs to decide who exactly is in charge. Here's General Brooks about that. The regime leadership structure has been fragmented. We've seen that the ability for the regime to communicate instructions has been disrupted. We've seen that the application of authority uh, has been interfered with on a number of occasions by coalition action. And we're not certain exactly who's in charge at this point in time. Central Command also responding to two separate incidents in which three journalists were killed by coalition fire in Baghdad. One incident in which an Al Jazeera correspondent was killed. CENTCOM says the soldiers took significant fire from the building which housed the uh, Al Jazeera workspace and returned fire. The second incident, uh, coalition forces also took what's described now as significant fire at the Palestine Hotel. Coalition forces returned fire. A Reuters photographer and a Spanish television photographer were both killed. And late in the evening here, there was a meeting at 
at Central Command among some of the generals and some of the higher ups here. Uh, and one of the things they discussed is what they see is a growing trend in Iraq of the Iraqi leadership uh, choosing to meet in public places like restaurants, like hotels, all in a means to pre all in an effort, I should say, to protect themselves. Shepard. Open live force at Central Command in Qatar. Mike, thanks very much. More on the most important events of the war today from Fox News military analyst, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Tim Eads. He's in our Washington War Room. Colonel, good to see you. Hi, Shepard. Thank you. Um, I guess we can start with these reports that an A-10 Warthog may have been taken down. I guess that's a, it's a valuable tool. It can it's just a little cumbersome that that vehicle, right? That airplane is, is an old airplane. It's designed specifically for cl for close air support. It's uh, designed to fly low and slow. The Iraqis do have uh, surface-to-air missiles, soldier-fired uh, anti-aircraft missiles, and apparently they got a lucky shot in and got one. Mm. Luckily, the pilot was able to eject and was recovered, which shows that uh, not only do we own the skies, but uh, we own most of the land now, too. Mm. Speaking of the land, we now own a landing strip, or reports indicate that we do, Rashid Airport. Uh, not a commercial airport, but more a military base to the south and east of the city. There's the A-10 Thunderbolt, and there's Rashid Military Airfield. Not a lot of talk about about this colonel but it seems to me given its location this is an important spot it's a very important spot and the marines third marines got into a really tough fight on this uh, uh, last night and this morning as you can see the airfield is almost as big as uh, baghdad international it's only one runway but that runway is about 10,000 feet long so it's quite a a, a, a pretty big facility. Uh, it, it appeared that most of the, uh, a lot of the Iraqi military that were in Baghdad seemed to be located at, at, this lo at this airfield as opposed to Baghdad International, where the 3rd ID got into some light resistance. They did have some resistance, but the 3rd Marines got into a heavy firefight here and, uh, and, and, and took it uh, with some difficulty, but took it uh, nonetheless. That's going to allow us to, uh, now we own uh, uh, airfields on both the east side and the west side of Baghdad. We can bring supplies in, we can bring aircraft in, uh, both fixed wing and helos, and uh, make it much easier for our forces to make quick penetrating assaults into the center of the city, into the, uh, into the residential areas uh, once we get more intelligence about leadership and those kind of things, and just all around makes, makes, makes life easier because now the Iraqis aren't going to know in which direction we're coming from. Well, I, I think that that's an important point. Do we have a, I hope we have an, a map of the Baghdad area because if you were to look at Baghdad, it's at the lower right-hand corner. There it is. Put that map of Baghdad from yeah. the screenwriter the up. Screen if up there. It's got it. Guys, if you could take that screenwriter full screen. To the bot. see where the Tigris is, and it's right in that last loop on the bottom. See that? From right there, you can take a highway directly into the center of town and right along the Tigris River, and it's going to be a terrific uh, area from a coalition standpoint for getting in there. Colonel, right. let's there talk specifically about the battles inside the city over the last 24 hours or so, aside from this drop on what's believed to be Saddam Hussein. Well, we had uh, we had a couple of things. We had the third uh, the third ID was in a, in a fight up in this area, which was in the area of uh, where we thought Saddam was. They made another penetrating uh, assault in there, and then finally, you know, we had this Al Rashid battle, which was kind of the, the the centerpiece for the Marines last night. They had to do a river crossing. The bridge was partially destroyed. They were able to get in there under the cover of darkness. Uh, repair the bridge, get the Marines across, and, and take that uh, that airfield. It was not an easy feat to do, and the Marines are to be complicated, uh, complimented for how quickly they did it. In addition to that, we still have these these couple of palaces, and those are some strategic locations, right, Colonel? Absolutely. Uh, this is just a, a, a satellite picture. If we look at uh, this, the, the uh, Al Rashid Airport is over here, and the uh, Baghdad International is there to just kind of orient you. But uh, you know, the palaces are in this area right here. Third ID is uh, is uh, pretty much in taking a break in place right there. You've seen the pictures probably in the newspaper today of the sergeant uh, sitting in the kind of uh, Saddam's throne uh, smoking a cigar. So uh, that gives you some idea of how common we are. As a matter of fact, that entire battalion has moved into that palace and have taken it over, and they've moved an entire brigade of age 64s into that palace area, parked them on hard concrete, and uh, are getting getting the soldiers some rest and giving the maintenance guys a chance to maintain those aircraft in the center of Baghdad. That's quite a feat. Indeed it is. What do you see as, as strategically speaking, what to take next? Well, we've got to start thinking about what do we do outside of Baghdad 
to take the rest of the rest of the uh, the country and to, in essence, when are we? What's the end game? When is it going to be over? Clearly, the next center of gravity, if you will, once we get Baghdad uh, taken care of, is Kirkuk and and, and Mosul in, in the north. Uh, that's up in the in the Kurdish area. Uh, Kirkuk and Tikrit are Saddam's uh, center of power. That's where he came from. That's his hometown. We've got to get those under control. That's probably where we're going to see the, the last uh, level of resistance. The other thing to just keep in mind, if we've got this western part that uh, will lead out of Baghdad into Syria, that really is the only escape for the leadership at this point. They're clearly not going to go into Iran and, uh, uh, because I don't think they'll be welcomed with open arms, there's arms there. So they're going to have to try to cross overland into Syria and our special operations forces and the 173rd up there, I, I imagine that will be their next critical mission to seal that border and make sure nobody's able to sneak out. Colonel, real quickly, when you look at the big picture and you see what's been captured inside Baghdad, the progress to the south and the north, does it appear to you that this, that this conflict is very close to over? It's, it's potentially very close to, to over, and that's a very dangerous time for our soldiers. We don't want to get too confident and start thinking to ourselves, you know, what time do we get on the boat or the airplane to go home? Uh, we got to keep, keep our soldiers focused, but clearly we're, we're, we're coming into the end game at this point. Colonel Tim Eads, good to see you, sir. Thanks very Thank much. You. Coming up from Thank Studio you. B, could it be another message from Osama bin Laden? Associated Press now saying they've gotten a tape that may be from the Al-Qaeda kingpin no confirmation yet, but we'll talk about what's said on that tape. And the Mansour section of Baghdad, we've been talking about it, could be the area where Saddam Hussein met his demise. And what's with this neighborhood that's targeted now for the third time over the years? We'll talk about that coming up. 15 minutes to Cavuto today and the details from the market and how it's reacting to what's happening on the battlefield. But first, a new audio tape from Associated Press, which they believe to be possibly from Osama bin Laden. And on this tape, the call for Muslims to wage jihad against the West. There's no confirmation on that that, that tape is actually UBL just yet, but it's in character. From Studio B Live now to Caroline Shively, who's reporting from our Washington newsroom today. Hey, Caroline. Hi there. Osama bin Laden, if it is indeed his voice, urges Muslims to launch attacks against the U.S. and Britain. The weapon of choice? Suicide bombings. The 27-minute tape calls for vengeance in the name of the innocent children of Iraq. He says if Muslims start the suicide attacks, they will see the fear of Americans all over the world. The U.S. and Britain aren't the only targets in the tape. It also calls for attacks on the governments of Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. It warns Americans we're not too far away way to be hit by terrorism, reminding us of September 11th. Here's a translation of part of that tape. For the first time, the majority of the American people are aware of the Palestinian issue and that what they faced in Manhattan was a result of their government's policy. The bottom line is that America is a powerful state with a mighty powerful power and a giant economy. However, all of this is based on a weak platform. Before this tape came out, suicide attackers had killed several U.S. troops in Iraq. Saddam Hussein's regime actually granted awards to those attackers after their deaths. In the past, Saddam has given millions of dollars to Palestinian suicide bombers who have killed Israelis. The voice on the tape says those who can't participate in the attacks should provide financial support. He also warns that the U.S. won't stop with the war in Iraq and will soon attack Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Sudan. Associated Press officials say they got that tape from an Algerian national who says the man on the tape is indeed Osama bin Laden. Now, we do not know if that is true. In fact, we still don't know if Osama bin Laden is alive or dead. Shep? Caroline Shively, live on our Capitol Hill newsroom. Caroline, thanks very much. Coming up from Studio B, coalition bombs aimed at the part of Baghdad where Saddam Hussein and key associates are very likely meeting. Okay. A Fox News military analyst tells us why the U.S. had a thick intelligence file on that particular neighborhood. Whether Saddam is alive or not, our commander in chief sending a clear message that even if Saddam was not hit last night, he doesn't have much time left. However, how much easier is this this campaign to carry out without him? And is there sometime propaganda from both sides? Details on that coming up. It's important for the Iraqi people to continue to hear this message. We will not stop until they are free. Saddam Hussein will be gone. 
It might have been yesterday. It, 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 I don't know. But he'll be gone. And they just need to know that. Because we're not leaving. And not only that, they need to hear the message that we're not leaving after he's gone until they are ready to run their own government. Nine minutes to Cavuto now on Fox News Channel. Coalition bombs aimed at a part of Baghdad thought to be where Saddam and key associates were meeting. It's a neighborhood pretty well known to U.S. intelligence, one we've targeted before. Retired Army Captain David Christian, the Fox News military analyst, with us now. Captain, good to see you. Good seeing you, Chef. Sorry the wall is dark behind you. I don't know what's going <laughs> on back there today. Hey, uh, when you look back over our history with Saddam Hussein, after the 91 Gulf War, we targeted that thing. Yes. They tried to blow up the World Trade Center, his neighbors or something. Right. We targeted that neighborhood. Yeah. Now we're targeting that neighborhood again. It's a neighborhood into which I can't travel and others who visit there can't travel. What's up there? He's got tunnels uh, leading from the palace, where, which we're occupying right now, that go into that neighborhood, uh, the Al Masur neighborhood. It's on the east bank of the Tigris. And they've actually been watching it. You know, this what they used to do historically in the old times of warfare. They used to put out blankets and watch the war. And people put are actually, out blankets and watch the war. People would put out blank picnic blankets and watch the the Civil War. Watch watch war like a parade. Yeah, just like it's entertainment. And there's the North and South fighting, and uh, you know they they would go and pull up in their carriages and whatever else. In this situation here, people are sitting at coffee shops on the east side of the Tigris and watching. You know, Greg Kelly with the third ID come rumbling in to the palace and they're watching the war and there's still life is going on so it's like the tiger is, is, is two wars it's separating two personalities the Almasud neighborhood that you're talking about has had a number of situations it also to, to further elaborate on what you were talking about um, his one son Uday was shot in the arm in that neighborhood and his other son was maimed in that neighborhood so we know our operatives, our CIA operatives, our special forces operatives, know that, that he's going to do something there. Supposedly this was the grand finale of meetings. One, that we're going to develop an exit strategy, so how he could get out of country. Maybe to Syria. And number two, which was the most important thing for the U.S., was the, how was the grand finale of this war? What, what were they going to do? Were they going to do the uh, weapons of mass destruction? Or were they going to, you know, how and when were they going to release chemicals? What type bombs? So that's exactly what they were, they were looking for in this situation here. They were having this meeting. We dropped four JDAM, JDAM bombs on them. First two 2,000 pound bombs, then two more with a slight delay so that you bomb the top, then it gets down and you bomb the bottom. It's, but then there are tunnels. It's 60 feet down in terms of rubble, but, and, and the tunnels have to be tremendously thick. And I've been in tunnels where the bombings have actually bounced off, because traditionally when, when a bomb hits, the reason they have the delay there, the bomb hits, you're hitting something that's relatively hard, and most of your blast goes out. It doesn't go in. So for the, the reason for the delay in a bomb is so that it penetrates, it goes in, and it has more of a concussion, which will take out and suck the... the, the uh, apparatus in terms of the, your concrete, it could be mud, dirt, whatever is around, and, and just crumble that all around them. So that tunnel would, would implode with the, the uh, force of the bomb, the weight of the bomb, and also the explosives of the bomb. So how do we find out? Well, they're going to be using tactics that were developed when identifying bodies after the World Trade Center bombing. Now, is, isn't, that, isn't that an interesting turn of events? I want to talk more about this neighborhood. In Castro's Cuba, especially in Old Havana, there are places where regular Cuban citizens can't go, and only Fidel's folks can go. Is this that kind of neighborhood, but Saddam? In many parts of the world, there happens to be two ways of life. The very aristocratic uh, social life and the impoverished. The majority of Iraq is waiting for food. You know, sixty percent of all people who live there, sixty percent of all people get all of their food from the United Nations Food Program. And it's the second largest country for oil reserves in the world. Something's wrong. Somebody's taking the money and somebody's doing a fast shuffle there. That's why our human shields that went there and they thought they were going to save, save the world and stop you know, us from bombing and have peace and everything. They were so disheartened because they, they did an interview with these people. They rode for hours on a bus and everything else. And when they got to the people said, we hate Saddam. What are you doing here? We hate him. We don't, we want him to, to leave. And this is the taxi drivers, the everyday workers, the 60% of the people that you're talking about. And, and the people, the human shields were shocked. They're thinking, well, 
who are we saving? Yeah. You know, what are we doing? So they, they made some mistakes. So evidently. you hear that from the taxi drivers and the rest, but what do you get from the police officers? They're the ones who were there protecting Saddam Hussein, and according to our reporters who've been in Baghdad, it's the police cars which are replaced every few months. The police cars are Mercedes. I mean, you'll see police cars, guys driving around in beautiful, and they're always brand new police cars, and always the most sophisticated equipment. He does take care of those who take care of him. Sure, indeed. Thanks very much, Captain Christian. Appreciate Thank it. You, Coming up, we'll be going live to Baghdad. Neil Cavuto is in in just a couple of minutes with the latest on Operation Iraqi Freedom. Also, talking to Winston Churchill's grandson of the former, the grandson of the former prime minister on the role of the United Nations in a post-Saddam Iraq. Freedom is spreading south to north. And so the only thing I can tell you is, is that that grip I used to describe that Saddam had around the throats of the Iraqi people are loosening. I can't tell you if all ten fingers are off the throat, but finger by finger is coming off. And, uh, and the people are beginning to realize that. So the, the lingering question is, did the coalition get him? We should know soon enough. And if so, does the rest of the resistance fall and does this war end as quickly as last night's explosions happened? Those are the unknowns. And the administration telling the coalition and Americans in general, hang on a minute, there could be big battles yet to be fought and Fox News will be there throughout. I'm Shepard Smith in New York. Thanks for trusting us for your news and information. Hope to see you back here tonight, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific for the Fox Report. And then later for the beginning of West Coast Primetime, 8 o'clock Pacific. And your alternative to your local 11 o'clock news on the East Coast or 10 in Central Time Zone. Your local news or a fair and balanced update on the war. Hope you choose us at night. Until then, stay brave, stay aware, and stay with Fox. Here's Neil. How you doing, buddy? Hey, thank you, Shepard, very much. Well, dead or alive on a day when the world wonders whether Saddam Hussein still walks this earth, a view from a guy who says it doesn't matter. He's toast anyway. And are the French toast again? U.S. officials insisting neither France nor the rest of the U.N. should have any dominant role post Iraq. But today, things just got a little nastier. We'll explain. And who believes this guy? Iraq's information minister every day telling reporters coalition troops are getting annihilated even as their planes fly over his head. Why there might be a method to his madness and what we have to do about it. All that and Winston Churchill's grandson on how his granddad would handle this new world order after this. The fight goes on while the French just prattle on. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto, and this is your world. Here's the latest on Operation Iraqi Freedom. More signs the war is still far from over. Our Rick Leventhal traveling with the 1st Marine Division, reporting at least eight Marines were hit in fierce urban fighting around Baghdad. Rick also reporting widespread looting is going on. U.S. officials also say that it now appears Iraq surface-to-air missiles shot down a coalition A-10 Warthog this morning, the pilot ejecting safely. And this is the big one. That's how the order was given to the crew of that B-1 bomber that dropped four 2,000-pound bunker busters on that Baghdad restaurant. The apparent target, Saddam Hussein and his two sons. Earlier, Fox spoke by phone with the pilot, Air Force Captain Chris Wachter. We had asked, uh, can we hit our original targets as well? We were told, negative, we need you to go direct towards this target. Guys, this might be the big one. U.S. officials say that it could be days before we know if Saddam is dead or alive. President Bush says he knows one thing. Saddam Hussein is losing his grip on power. Finger by finger, the president wrapping up his summit with British Prime Minister Tony Blair in England. The president says the U.N. will play a vital role in rebuilding Iraq. That is not enough for the French. President Jacques Chirac says it is up to the U.N. alone to handle the reconstruction of Iraq. And investors hanging on the sidelines, waiting to see how things play out. The Dow Jones Industrial is losing about two points. So is Saddam a goner? And should we be concerned by the breakout of urban warfare in Baghdad? Fox team coverage now with Heather Nauert in Amman, Jordan, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich in Washington, and some perspective from the grandson of Winston Churchill, Winston S. Churchill, standing by in Boynton Beach, Florida. We begin now with the latest of the bombing campaign, and for that we go to Heather Nauert in Amman, Jordan. Heather. 
Hi there, Neil. Well, first up today, troops moving farther into Baghdad and confirmation of a coalition airstrike against a building where Saddam Hussein and his sons were believed to be meeting. Also, reporters getting caught in the, ba in the battle today, a dramatic day's events. But first up, hunting for Saddam Hussein. Uh, protecting men on the battlefield is normally done by the air through close ground air, uh, air support now. But today, a B-1 bomber uh, basically protecting this makeshift meeting place where Saddam Hussein, his sons, and at least 20 members of his leadership were believed to be meeting. Uh, the target building was in a residential neighborhood, and it's believed that Hussein could be hiding out in civilian places. Eyewitness, eyewitness intelligence today indicating that someone who looked like Hussein entered the building, but no word yet on whether anyone made it out. It'll be days, possibly weeks, before we get any kind of confirmation on that. Now, on the ground today, troops moving closer into the heart of Baghdad, the Army's 3rd Infantry Division blasting their way past another government building, the Ministry of Planning in central Baghdad, also testing out the Republic Bridge, which stretches over the Tigris River. It's the farthest that coalition forces have moved into the city yet. And also today, three more reporters killed in the battle, essentially turning deadly for these reporters. First, the office of Arab Television Network, Al Jazeera, was a target of a believed airstrike today. U.S. commanders coming under fire that they believe was coming from the building. One of Al Jazeera's correspondents was killed today. And also, snipers firing on coalition forces from the nearby Palestinian hotel. That's according to officials at Central Command. The hotel is where all journalists in the area are required to stay. Now, a tank returned fire, killing two journalists and injuring two others. Also, Iraq's information minister, we've heard a lot from him lately. He basically showed up right after the tragedy, claiming that coalition troops are not only targeting civilians, but are also targeting journalists. He claims that Iraqi forces will protect journalists and civilians. And also on, on an interesting note, Neil, uh, basically you'd think that after all the video we've seen over the days of U.S. and coalition forces in and around Baghdad, that the Arab world would believe that forces are there and that basically the forces are doing a good job of getting the Iraqis. Well, if you believe that, you're wrong. Much of the Arab world actually believes this is all a Hollywood production. That's the latest from Amman, Jordan. Neil, back to you in New York. You know, Heather, I've heard that as well, and that they really don't believe that coalition forces are, in fact, in Baghdad. Uh, but I would imagine right. the more indications we get of, 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 of people in Iraq not speaking out, um, that will change, or will it? Uh, we just don't know. Uh, you know, some indications are basically that as more people flee Iraq, the word will get out uh, in the Arab community that, that, that coalition forces are there and are getting some of the Iraqis, so to speak. But we just have to wait and see. All right, Heather Nauer, thank you very much. Reporting Thanks. from Amman, Jordan. Well, earlier this morning, President Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair held their third meeting in uh, three weeks, saying that Saddam Hussein's grip on power was slipping quickly from his fingers. I think anyone who has seen the joy on the faces of people in Basra as they realize that the regime that they detest is finally collapsing knows very well that this was indeed a war of liberation and not of conquest. President Bush also said that the United Nations would play a vital role in Iraq's reconstruction, and is this a good idea? Let's ask former British parliamentarian Winston S. Churchill, author and grandson, of uh, the former British Prime Minister. Mr. Churchill, good to have you back. My pleasure. Let me ask you a little bit about this post-Iraq uh, UN role. Should there be one? Well, I think inevitably the UN has a role. The big question is uh, how great a role. Uh, it has an important role in food aid, in humanitarian aid, and I think that is something that we would all welcome. Uh, what we emphatically don't want, at least I emphatically don't want, and I doubt that the administration would wish to see, is that those who were the principal protectors of Saddam Hussein and his regime, namely the governments of France, uh, Russia and China, uh, who are permanent members of the Security Council, that they should have a veto over how matters unfold in Baghdad and in a liberated Iraq. Why and how could you explain the French intransigence on this issue? 
Uh, I think it has many reasons. The loss of their past greatness, uh, that they have never forgiven the Anglo-Saxons for liberating them, and I doubt if they ever will. Uh, they seem to find it easier to forgive the Germans for occupying them for five years. But uh, I think, uh, above all, they uh, see uh, the world through a totally different perspective than the British and the Americans. And we viewed with grave concern the uh, stockpiling of uh, an amassing of weapons of mass destruction, which I have no doubt will be found uh, once this war is over. I, I just and have a feeling, uh, though, Mr. Churchill, that even if we found proof that those were indeed stockpile weapons, uh, even if we had unequivocal proof that there was a distinct Al-Qaeda connection between the events of September 11th and Iraq, uh, the French uh, would probably still say no. Uh, they probably still would. Um, they feel that uh, they would like to be running the show, and if they can't call the shots and control this great American Goliath, this only superpower that bestrides the globe, then uh, let's try and take him down a peg or two. Let's uh, humiliate him. And I think that was the game plan of President Chirac, a very foolish game plan, I might say, and uh, I'm sure it's one that uh, France will pay for. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, Tony Blair and, and President Bush. Of course, they've been meeting over the last couple of days, and, and there does seem to be a perception that they want to keep the French happy, they want to keep the Germans happy, much of that presumably at the behest of Tony Blair. What's to stop us from just telling the French and the Germans, the hell with you? Well, one can do that, but I mean, if it's possible to uh, rebuild bridges and uh, get them back on side in a constructive, positive way, then uh, we should do so. Um, but certainly we shouldn't go cap in hand to them saying, it's over to you now. Uh, you know, it is American and British blood with, which will have liberated Iraq. And uh, that is something that we cannot forget. Now, let's talk a little bit about the relationship between the president and Tony Blair. They met for the third time in as many weeks. They have struck up an oddly close relationship considering they come from different ends of the political spectrum. Would you have been able to see this kind of closeness in war with Tony Blair and Bill Clinton? Uh, I suppose it's possible, but whether Bill Clinton would have gone to war, I don't know. Um, but undoubtedly, uh, there is an incredibly strong and close bond between uh, these two men who basically are from different political backgrounds. They have wholly different political perspectives. But on one thing, they agree absolutely that Saddam is a major threat to the world and had to be dealt with, and had to be dealt with not by diplomacy, but by force of arms. And I salute their courage. All right, Winston S. Churchill, thank you, sir. A real pleasure.